Welcome back to another episode of 10 in 10, the series where I show you 10 useful tips for survival, camping and bushcraft in roughly 10 minutes. In the previous episode, we looked at 10 different skills that you could do with a saw. And in the one before that, we looked at 10 bushcraft axe skills. If you enjoy this type of video, feel free to subscribe and follow the links in the video description below for more similar episodes. In conditions where the wind is strong, it can often be difficult to set up a tarp for a shelter. One of the fastest and easiest shelters to make with a tarp is the plough point. To help you in setting up this shelter in strong winds, you can store your tarp in the side pocket of your pack. That way, you can pull the tarp out of the pack and tie one corner to the tree. The weight of the pack is helping to prevent the wind from catching the tarp and blowing it around potentially causing it to snag against sharp sticks and branches. Once you have tied the first corner around the tree, you then have time to peg out the remaining corners of the tarp to form the sides of the shelter. To stop your tarp from blowing straight out of the side pocket, you can loop it around the zip and then undo this loop last minute to peg out the final corner of the shelter. In my opinion, the plough point shelter is the easiest tarp one to set up. It gives you ample space inside for you and your pack, and it's also really easy to manoeuvre the shelter around so that the back is facing the wind. There's no hassle of having to tie a ridgeline or have any guy lines to tie down. It's always a good idea to have some sort of cordage with you in your pack. It's highly versatile and has a number of uses. Often in winter, you need to collect more firewood than in the warmer summer months. Cut two sticks about a length of your arm and then put a point on one end of the stick and bevel the other end. Tie some cord at equal lengths to the two sticks. I use an arbor knot to secure the cord tight to the sticks. Make sure both pieces of cord are equal in length. Now you have a log carrier to carry large amounts of firewood. The two sticks act as a carrying handle and make it much easier to carry small or even quite large long logs back to your camp. As well as being a log carrier, it can also double up as something else that might be useful around camp. This is the reason why points have been made on the end of the stick. If you knock the sticks into the ground, ensuring that the paracord between the sticks is taut, you now have a makeshift drying rack, which you can use to dry clothes near the campfire. You could even adapt this to make a horizontal drying rack for smoking meat over the fire. A hessian sack is not something you might think of as being a mainstay item in your backpack, but they can actually be pretty useful. They fold up small, take up little space in your pack, and they tend to be supplied with natural twine to tie the sacks up when you have filled them. The sacks can be great for carrying things like stones to create a protective ring for your campfire. You can use a short stick to tie the hessian sack to and to keep it close to your body when carrying it over long distances. This should help ease the strain on your arms and shoulders. You can also use the natural twine to attach the sack like I did here. However, with heavy loads, I would recommend either tying the sack onto itself or using some stronger cordage. The other useful thing about the natural twine is that you can fluff it up by rubbing it together between your fingers, and this can act as a great tinder material for starting a fire. Once the fine, dry fibres have been exposed, they should be able to take a spark from a ferro rod. Natural twine can burn for quite a while, so it can be good in wet conditions when you need that extra long flame to catch your kindling. Boiling water is key for survival. It kills nasty bacteria, parasites and viruses. It should always be done if you are not sure on the quality of the water source nearby. The best and fastest way to boil water is in a metal container. When you have hot coals you can place your container straight onto the coals and boil it that way. However, you have to wait for your fire to get a good bed of embers. A simple grill is not only good for cooking food over the fire, but it's also ideal as a stand for your pot to sit on. If you place two larger logs either side of your campfire, you can then balance your grill on these and place your container on top. This way you can keep adding sticks into the fire through the gap in the logs. 
This method works fine, but sometimes the logs can affect the airflow and can result in your fire not burning very efficiently. If you get a short stick, again roughly the length of your arm, and make a number of small cuts into it with a saw, you can place these cuts at any distance apart, but I tend to do just three cuts about the length of the saw handle. Make a point on the stick and then gently hit it into the ground. Now you have three adjustable heights to hold your grill, which means you can make use of the early flame from a campfire to get your water boiled and you can adjust it to always keep it near the flame. Another easy way of raising the grill of your fire is to use three tent pegs. Tent pegs are generally quite light these days and they don't take up much space in your pack. If you place the pegs into the ground in a triangle shape and then place your grill on top, you then have a makeshift stand for your boiling container. Just make sure not to place your container near the edges of the grill as these will likely make it unstable and your water could fall off and potentially extinguish your fire. This type of grill allows you to feed the fire underneath and also allows for good airflow to maintain an efficient burn. Gallium aparine, also known as cleavers, goosegrass and many more nicknames. It's one of the earliest wild edibles to show its face after the cold winter months. Fairly easy to identify, they are an annual creeping plant which grow along the ground and attached to other plants with tiny hooked hairs on the underside of the leaf and the stem. The leaves themselves are thin, narrow and grow in halls of six to eight. In spring, they have tiny star-shaped flowers which tend to be white. It tends to grow in hedges, by paths in the woods and also as a common garden weed. The tiny hairs on the leaves and stem are what most of you might know them from. As kids, we used to throw these at each other and watch as they would cling to the clothing without the other person noticing. But it's the medicinal properties of this plant that we are looking for. It has been used to treat skin problems such as psoriasis and eczema. It's also a diuretic and can benefit in the treatment of glandular fever, tonsillitis, hepatitis and many more ailments. It can be used as a poultice to treat wounds but probably its most common use is as a spring tonic drink or tea. If you want to make a cold fusion, you can steep it in water and keep it cool for 24 to 48 hours for the best effect. But you can also boil some water and place the leaves in and let it steep for 20 minutes and have yourself a nice fresh wild tea. The humble pencil sharpener, not something you would really consider keeping in your kit but it's only small and light, taking up very little space. On wet conditions, it can be great to expose the dry wood underneath the bark. Using a small twig, you can create very thin, fine curls. If you make enough of these curls, they should be able to take a spark from a ferro rod quite easily. If you use stick, such as pine, it is full of resin, and a thin curl should burn for quite some time, allowing you to build up your fire with small twigs and kindling. Pencil sharpeners are also a great way for children who are not yet able to safely create feather sticks with a knife to use this safe method and make fine curls and practice getting a fire going with a ferro rod. Corylus avellana, the hazel tree, a very common small tree that has a wide range of uses in the bushcraft and survival world. The tree itself is well known as a coppice material and grows in hedgerows as well as woodland. It's ideal for weaving fence panels, making spars for thatching roofs, and many more crafting activities. It's not the first tree that comes to mind when you think about fire lighting materials. However, the hazel tree is a great resource for primitive fire lighting, in particular the bow drill method. Because of the nature of the tree, it grows multiple shoots from the same stem, and so these shoots are always in competition for light especially when they are growing amongst larger trees like oak and ash. As a result, they tend to grow very straight. This makes them an ideal resource for the spindle of the bow drill kit. They need very little work to get them ready. All that is needed is for the bark to be removed at the tip and it pointed on one end and slightly rounded at the other end. Slightly thicker branches of the tree 
can be split down the middle and you have yourself a hearth board. Because hazel is very pliable, you can bend it easily to make the bow. Before you know it, you can fashion up a bow drill set, all from the same species of tree. Obviously, the wood will need to be dry and not green, but I find that a hazel spindle on a hazel hearth board works extremely well with the bow drill method. And there you have it, another 10 tips in roughly 10 minutes video has come to an end. Many thanks to all of you who watched the episode, and remember, if you enjoyed it, be sure to follow the links in the video description below to other survival tip videos, and feel free to subscribe for more content like this. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.